Schmitz. I'm a local extension educator with the University of Minnesota, and I work in Stearns, Benton, and Morrison counties, which is in the central portion of the state. And I focus on horticulture, small farms, and local foods. And I have the pleasure of working with two master gardener groups, the Stearns County Extension Master Gardeners and the Benton County Extension Master Gardeners, and really enjoy working with all of them. So that is a little bit about me. I will throw it over to Robin to do a quick introduction. She is going to be our other speaker today. Hi, I'm Robin Trott, and I am the local extension educator in Douglas County. And my um, area of expertise or that I um, teach in is horticulture and small farms and local foods. And I have a master gardener group in Douglas County of about 65 active master gardeners who are out there in their gardens already. And I'm really happy to join you today. Awesome, thank you, Robin. So you'll hear more from Robin here in a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we will get started here. Okay. Robin, can you just let me know that that is showing up well? I see it, Katie, I see it. All right, good deal. So today to stick, uh, kick off our Gardening from the Ground Up webinar series, we're going to start with soil and soil testing. And Robin and I read a lot of soil tests throughout the years, so we wanted to let you guys know what those actually mean and then how to do a soil test and really why that matters. So to get started, I am going to do another poll here. So if you guys can answer that poll, have you done a soil test in your yard or garden in the last three years? Give me just a couple of minutes here to get that answered. All right. I'm going to end that poll and share with you what our results are. So over 68% of you have never done a soil test in your yard or garden. About 50 or 32% of you have done it and 1% of you don't remember, you're unsure. So that's really good for us to know as we get started here to be able to show you what we're going through. So for anyone who hasn't done one or maybe it's been a while since you've done a soil test, we want to share with you. There we go. Uh, this is a quick video that is going to explain how to take a soil test for you and we'll go ahead and kick off by watching that. Uh, share the uh, computer sound on the... Oh, whoops, sorry. Um, uh, Shane, can you help me out with... Sure. Sorry, guys, give us one second here. Do you know where I need to click, Shane? I think I know oh, if you share the screen um, and you have those windows that you can select, there should be a share computer sound in the bottom left somewhere. So if you're sharing that tab. Okay. Um, not seeing that. Sorry, guys. All right, Shane, I'm going to give you control of my screen if you want to fix it. <laughs> I think I have to be at your computer. Okay. Um, well, I gave you remote control was what I was trying to do. Katie, exit and share again. Hit that exit and then share again. Okay. Get this, guys. I'm sorry. 
And while you're sharing your screen, I see it. I see it. Tab. Yep, yep, I got it. We're good now. All right. I'm going to try again here. I am really sorry about this. <laughs> A simple hand trowel, a bucket. It doesn't have to be a five gallon bucket, but that is what I had on hand today. And then you will need the form that you can get from your local extension office and the soil sample bag also from your local extension office. This is the soil test form that you will get from your local extension office. On here, you need to fill out just a couple of simple things. Your name, address, and phone number, the soil location county, your check for the amount of money that you are, or for what it costs to get the test that you are getting. Most of the time, I have people start with a regular test. If there are deeper issues, we can always go deeper for next. Then you need to check the box that you are dealing with. In this case, I would check it for gardens, vegetable gardens. I also choose my soil test identification number here. This includes, can be any um, letter or number combination. In this case, since my name is Katie Druitz, I would likely do KD. This is in our backyard garden, so I might put BG. So my code would be KDBG. To take your soil test, you want to take it from multiple locations in your yard or garden. On the back of the soil test form, it does walk you through these instructions in a very clear format. With the uh, garden that I'm going to be using today, I have decided on three locations throughout my garden to ensure that I get a good sample of what the soil in my garden is. We have determined the three areas that we want to take our soil sample in our garden. So now it's time to actually take the sample. As you can see, this garden was covered in quite a bit of leaf debris and litter from overwintering. So I've cleared that away and now we can start to take our sample. On your sample form, it does give you the instructions for a garden to go down zero to six inches. I always like to go down in that four to six inch area. So we're gonna simply dig into our soil and then we have our five gallon bucket, put that in there. I'm going to go ahead and do two scoops in my locations today. And then you're ready to move on to the next area. Let's go. three soil samples from our three locations in our garden in our bucket. Now we simply want to mix that around so that when we submit our sample it's a nice even distribution of all the locations from our soil sampling site. All right now that we have our properly mixed soil sample we're going to put that sample into our sample bag. Now you will have wanted to write your name, address, and identification number onto your sample bag before putting the soil in, just so it's a little easier. So we open up that soil bag and we start to scoop in our soil. There is a maximum fill line on the soil bag. So it's going to take just a couple of scoops to get that in there. Once you're at that maximum line, you're going to simply fold down the bag and fold it closed. Then you will place your sample bag along with your filled out form into the mail and send it to the University of Minnesota Soil Testing Lab. In about two weeks, you'll receive your results back. At that time, you can read those results yourself or reach out to your local extension educator and they can help you interpret the results as well. Today we have learned how to properly take a soil sample using the University of Minnesota Extension Soil Test Sample Kit. Again, these can be found at your local Extension office and the forms can also be downloaded online from extension.umn.edu. 
Now that you properly know how to take a soil test from your yard or garden, remember that this should be done once every three years to make sure that you are giving your plants the nutrients they need to properly grow. If you have questions, please reach out to your local extension educator and they can assist you through this process. I'm Katie Druitz with the University of Minnesota Extension, local extension educator for horticulture, small farms, and local foods in Stearns, Benton, and Morrison counties. All right, so there we had uh, just the basics on how to take a soil test. Some of you had done that, but for those of you who had never done so, I hope that was helpful in figuring out that process. So once you get your soil test back, there's quite a bit of information that you can gather from that. And that's really what we're going to dig into today. But to start off with, we are going to take a look at soil texture. So one of the first things that you will see across your soil test results is the relative soil texture. Most of the ones that I get back are in this coarse range. So that tells me that I am dealing with a sandy or loamy sand soil. And as we go through here, we're going to see how that's going to impact things such as our water movement, the available nutrients as we get into tomorrow with Troy and Shane and Bob, or sorry, Troy and Adam and Bob. They are going to talk a little bit more about the uh, nutrients that are available, but it's really important to know what your soil is. So those sandy soils are among the coarse, and then we have loam or silt soils that are in that medium area, and then a fine soil is in clay. And if we take a look at what these particles really mean. So sand is our biggest particle. You can see a grain of sand, you know, if you, when we get back to being able to go to the beach or to the lake, uh, we can go ahead and look at that sand and you can see those individual particles. So those particles are going to have more space in between them if it's pure sand, which makes a lot of sense when we think about if water goes over sand, it drains very quickly. It doesn't very often sit on top of that sand. It's going to start filtering down through the sand very quickly. And then we have the next smallest, which is silt. And with silt, uh, if it was pure silt, if you've ever felt flour, like in your kitchen, baking flour, silt feels a lot like that. It's very smooth, very soft, much finer particles than what our sand particle is. And then finally, we have clay. Most of us have had some experience with pure clay, whether uh, back in elementary school, playing with some art, or maybe with your grandkids now, uh, working with that clay product. So clay, those particles are more of a flat particle. So when they combine together, they stack on top of each other in almost an interlocking pattern. So that is something that we have to keep in mind when we're looking at how our water and nutrients are going to flow throughout that soil. Now, most of our soils are going to be a combination of these three types of particles, but these are all things that we need to keep in mind. So when we're looking at our water filtration, again, with that sand, it's gonna flow pretty quickly through it. Silt is kind of in that medium flow and clay, it's gonna take a, quite a while. So if we um, water very quickly or a lot all at once, the water is more likely to run off of that area than it is to actually soak in. And a more clay soil is going to take more time for that water to infiltrate down to our root system. I often get asked, so where does potting soil fit into this conversation when we're talking about sand, silt, and clay? It really depends on what that type of potting soil that you are using. If you're using something, um, if we're talking like a house plant, you're planting an orchid, that's going to be extremely coarse, um, you know, has a lot of big materials. Whereas a more traditional potting soil that you might be putting into a vegetable container garden is going to have quite a bit of air in it, um, but it's not going to let water go through quite as quickly as a more coarse option. It might also have water beads in it. So maybe it holds on to water more readily than what some of our other ones does, 
Does it have fertilizer in it? Or is that perlite that you're seeing? So there's lots of things that you need to look at. The other thing to consider is location. So is your pot sitting out in direct sun, maybe on blacktop or concrete, where it's going to have a heat source from both the sun and then also the concrete that's underneath it? That could mean that your soil is going to dry out much more quickly than it normally would. And then also it has good drainage holes, at least I hope so if you're using a potted mix, making sure that that drainage is available. So these are all things that you need to consider. And oftentimes by just getting your fingers in there and feeling that soil, you can start to feel the differences between a sandy or a more clay soil and really getting to know where does my potting soil that I'm using fit into there. And oftentimes on your bag, it will tell you what that potting soil mixture is going to be. And when you look at it, does it have sticks and things like that in it, or is it more just of a black dirt type? So really having those thoughts as you look through things. And then as we talked about, there are different um, abilities of each of these soils. So whether we are looking at a finely textured or coarsely textured. So water holding capacity, we talked about this one a little bit where clay soil is going to hold that water much more readily, but it's going to take longer for that water to infiltrate. Whereas sand isn't going to have a lot of water holding capability. And the same goes for our nutrients. So we'll get into this a little bit more tomorrow, uh, but how our water flows through is going to affect how our nutrients also flow through with that water. So keeping that in mind when we're looking at what type of fertilizers we're using, um, how often we maybe need to add nutrients to that, and how that's going to impact our growing environment. And then what our compaction is. This is something I see quite often more on the lawn side where maybe someone just built a house recently and there was a lot of compaction from that heavy equipment and now they're trying to grow grass and it's just not working very well because of that compaction. And although there's a lot of sand maybe on top of the soil, what's underneath that is what we have to consider. So all of this stuff uh, plays together and goes into the same area. And then of course with drainage kind of circles back to our water holding capacity. So the clay soil, high water holding capacity, but is going to drain very slowly. So if you have a low spot in your garden or you're constantly watering, you may end up causing more issues with the water than what you're fixing there. And then if it's going to warm up very fast in the spring as well. So if you think about, you know, again, going back to dreaming of walking on a beach right now, <laughs> um, if you're walking on a beach and you feel that pure sand, it gets very warm very quickly. The same thing happens in your garden. If you have a lot of sand in your garden, it's going to warm up much more quickly than if you have a lot of clay in your garden. So these are all things that we have to keep in mind when we're looking at what type of soil do I have. You might be thinking, well, if I have a very clay soil, maybe I should just add some sand to it and that would kind of fix my problems. So we can't really change soil texture. The example here on the screen, if we were to go from a clay loam soil which is about 35 silt and clay and 30% sand, and try to change that to a sandy loam soil, 15% silt and clay and 70% sand, so pretty big jump in our sand, in just a 100 square foot garden, would take nearly two tons of sand. So at that, that point, it's not realistic to be changing our soil texture, which is why we need to learn how to work with and live around the soils that we have and getting, <clears throat> excuse me, getting our soil tested can really assist in that process. Another fun thing that you can use is the soil texture triangle. So our soil texture triangle can help you determine what you have. Also, if you get a soil test, it will, you know, going back to that beginning where it maybe said you had a coarse soil which might be down here in our sandy loam. So you're looking at, you know, 60% sand, 
uh, maybe about a 15% clay and 35% silt. So that just gives you an idea of what you are really dealing with in your area. Soil triangle is a great resource to be used. You can find one, uh, just a simple Google search will pull up your soil test triangle um, to be used there. So with that, we are going to do a little bit of presenter switch. So Robin, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then as we're doing this, we are going to answer some questions as Robin is getting ready to switch over. So Claire or Adam or Shane, are there any questions out there that we should answer at this time? We are keeping up pretty well with the Q&A in the chat. So Robin is answering questions there and Adam's got some going. Um, somebody is asking about if we can review the recordings after the fact. Absolutely. Yep. So that's a really good just kind of housekeeping question is this entire webinar series is being recorded and you will all receive links to that later on this week. So that is something that you will be able to use a little bit later on. Here we go. Oh. All right. Um, Keep asking those questions. We've got a really good team there. Uh, this is Robin Trott. Again, I'm the horticulture educator in Douglas County. And now that you've gotten your soil test back, this is what your test is gonna look like. And so Katie looked at the, the soil texture. This is actually a sample test that came from our soil lab. Um, and then the next thing you're gonna look at the, the next little box is going to give you your percentage of organic matter. And you can see in this box, it says 2.5%, which isn't a lot. Now organic matter, um, I'm gonna go back here. There is no reading here of nitrogen in your soil. And the reason that is, is the nitrogen and the fertilizer, re fertilizer recommendations are, are based on that percentage of organic matter in your soil. The organic matter, as it breaks down, provides nitrogen for your plants. And so you won't get a nitrogen reading on this test. You'll get an organic matter reading. And the higher the organic matter is in your soil, the more nitrogen will be available for your plants as that organic matter breaks down. <laughs> organic matter, has many important functions. It improves soil structure, that water infiltration and drainage, the soil aeration, which means the amount of oxygen that's available for your plants, especially on clay type soils. Now, Katie said she sees a lot of tests that come back with that sandy or sandy loam. The tests that I see that come back are heavy clay. I've got very heavy clay to the point where when it gets really wet, I'm walking around with clay mud shoes and my feet get very heavy. So for, for me, it's very important to build the organic matter in the soil because it helps with the soil aeration and reduces the amount of compaction. That organic matter also is a reservoir for those nutrients that are available for the plants you grow and it increases the water holding capacity in sandy soils. So adding organic matter, adding compost to your soils, no, it's not going to change permanently your soil texture, but it is going to help your plants overall. So finding a good compost, making sure that compost is not um, made out of grass clippings that have been treated with herbicides, being careful the compost is not necessarily from a ditch hay that comes through animals because that can have pesticide in it. And you can see that your low percentage is that below 3% or 3% or below, and it goes up the scale. So 19% plus, you've got good organic material in your soil. When organic matter is low, there are uh, large amounts of peat compost, crop residues, manures, or other organic amendments are required to change the organic matter content of the soil. But this is temporary. Can you put it in once and figure that your organic matter is going to be good for a long time? No, it's not because this organic material, like I said, breaks down in your soil and will 
um, decline over time. So it's a good idea to put that organic material in your garden at regular intervals. That's why we recommend doing soil tests every three to five years, because if you have gardened in that spot consistently over that time, you are going to use up the organic material and the nutrients that are available in that soil. It's going to change based on how densely you plant and what it is you plant. So you can't just add organic matter once and think it's not one and done. This is a consistent care for your garden. The next thing we're going to talk about, and this is a huge issue, and I know that Troy and Adam um, and Bob are going to talk about pH tomorrow. This again is very consistent with my garden. We have a very high pH level in our soil. My pH level is verging on what you see here, high sevens even into the mid eights for my soil. Um, so it's a very alkaline soil. The problem is the water that comes out of my well is also very alkaline. So if you look at this test and the pH level in this test, the numbers here are, are on the high side, on the alkaline side. The, um, the importance of this is that most plants, the optimum amount of, uh, or the neutral pH is uh, around that six. And many, many of our garden plants prefer a slightly acidic soil. So when you have uh, be above the optimum, above neutral, or above high into the alkalinity, that can uh, cause many problems with the plants that you grow in your garden. So we're looking at this and you can see, think about this, this, this chart really um, opened my eyes because it compared the acidity and the alkalinity of soil to things that you might be um, familiar with. So if you could have a zero or one acidity in your soil and you're not gonna see that, that's battery acid. Not only will that burn your plants, but I don't know that you can get anything to grow in when it's that acidic. If you look at that six, between five and six, that's normal rain and between the six and the eight sort of, it's that distilled water. And then we start getting up until the really high alkalinity. And again, I don't think you're gonna see a 13 or 14, but that's lie and that will burn you too. So you're looking at those two very extremes. I have never seen those numbers in a garden unless there's something um, really that has happened, an event that has caused that. But you wanna see that normal rain distilled water for the most part or slightly acidic for some plants. This is important to know because it affects the availability of several plant nutrients. I have a lot of problem with iron chlorosis or calcium deficiency in my plants. And both of those, even though my soil has a lot of that in it, those micronutrients, the alkalinity of my soil and the alkalinity of my water bind those nutrients in my soil and make them unavailable for my plants. It can also impact the activity of your soil microorganisms, which all of these living things in your soil help, they benefit the health of your plant. And so you don't want it really high pH, high alkaline or high acidic because it will impact that activity of those microorganisms. And then the ability of the soil to hold plant nutrients um, to retain them so that they are available for, for plants is, is impacted by your pH. And I, I chose this picture of the hydrangeas because there are several hydrangeas um, that might be hardy in southeastern Minnesota, uh, not so hardy out in Douglas County where I am, that you can actually change the color of that hydrangea by changing the pH of the soil. So adding acid will make it blue and adding alkaline will make it pink. And that's just a real um, clear picture of how that can change even the color of the plant. I have tall garden phlox and when it grows in my garden, it's pink. It's a very pink phlox. When I cut it and I put it in a vase, 
with distilled water and some floral preservative in 24 hours, that phlox will turn blue. And it's, it's the most remarkable thing. And it has to do with a pH that is in my soil. With a high pH, it turns it pink. There is no permanent fix for soil pH, just as there's no permanent fix for soil texture. You can temporarily fix it, especially if you're looking to plant something that really wants a little more acid or a little more alkaline. And these are the things that you can add to your soil to change it. Sphagnum peat, elemental sulfur, that aluminum sulfate that you can get, iron sulfate, the acidifying nitrogen and organic mulches, they can temporarily um, bring down the alkalinity of your soil. Or lime can temporarily bring down, make your soil less acidic. But this is something that you would have to do every year um, because as water runs through the soil, the, or as the soil changes and matches what's around it, you can ch it, it will change back to what it was originally. So think about the plants that you're planting, know those plants, and know if they're greatly impacted by um, your acidity or alkalinity of your soil. Uh, I can't stress that enough because blueberries and things like that, they like an acidic soil. Um, Throwing pine needles over top of those blueberries isn't going to change your alkaline soil to an acidic soil for those plants. So think about what you need to do over time and maybe what you need to do ahead of time to prepare beds if they need a little bit of acidity. Further reading soil tests. The next one we're going to look at. Um, this is your medium soil texture. We're just going to go through this whole test now. You have a medium soil texture with an organic matter of 1.7%. Now remember, that's on the low end of that organic matter. That's what you're going to want to build in that soil prior to planting. Now this, this soil test also has soluble salts. They've looked for soluble salts in this soil. Uh, and the soluble salts can build up in that soil depending on the usage of that um, garden in the past. Perhaps there's been fertilizer and it's being held into the soil and build up the salt content. You don't want a lot of soluble salts in the soil. And if you look here, this is satisfactory for the soluble salts. This is a separate test you would pay for if you are concerned about that. And you can see on the soluble salts on the right hand side under pH, it would. Um, this could be very high. This is fairly low. The pH is 5.1, so that's a, a, that's a good, maybe uh, slightly acidic, not very much acidic. And the, the buffer index is used to determine lime, lime requirements for acidic soils. So the buffer index is 6.8. We're looking at the phosphorus. That's NPK. Remember, we're not doing nitrogen. We are uh, the nitrogen, we're assuming from the organic material, so we want to build that. Phosphorus is very important because it feeds the roots of your plants. And potassium is very important because it feeds the fruits. So potassium is up, phosphorus is down, and nitrogen is all around. Let's take a look. Here the phosphorus is very high on this soil test. We're gonna look again, it's medium textured soil with a 2.5% organic matter. So that again is fairly low. Remember 3.0 and under is a low organic matter. We're going to build that up. With a seven pH, that's fairly high. It's an alkaline soil. Now it's, it's looking at two different pH um, scales right here, the Bray scale. Um, and I can't remember what this one's called. It's a different scale. They're looking at both of those. And that's what our scientists base their recommendations on. So now we're going to look down and look at the recommendations. The Lyme recommendation for this particular test, and you can see this is for azalea and rhododendron. So this is a soil 
they check that box. This soil needs to be slightly acidic or more acidic than other soils do. These plants prefer acidity. Lime recommendation, though, is zero pounds per square foot. We're not going to put any lime on this. The amount of each nutrient to apply per year. Nitrogen, it's not recommending. Phosphate, it's not recommending. But pot, potash or potassium, 0.2 pounds per 100 square feet. Sulfur, the approximate ratio or proportion of these nutrients is 15, 0, 30. Sulfur, 5.8 pounds per 100 square feet. Remember, this is for azaleas and rhododendrons. They prefer an acidic soil. So we're going to apply sulfur. So 15, 0, 30. What happens when you're going to the um, store and you can't find a 15, 0, 30? I think this was a question that came up on our question and answer page. You find as close as you can. Don't worry about finding exactly because this is telling you the ideal um, ratios of these nutrients for your garden to make it perfect. Your garden is never going to be perfect, but it's going to be beautiful. So find what you can. You don't have to order a custom mix to make it exactly 15, 0, 30. You want to find a mix that comes as close to that as possible. And sometimes what it's going to require is that you take and purchase the individual components and mix them yourself. If you can find that sulfur in a bag, you can find that um, potash in a bag and mix it yourself. But you don't have to do that. You can buy pre-mixed fertilizers. Now we're going to look at this and the approximate ratio. This is a different test. Oh no, this is the same recommendations for azalea and rhododendrons. So 0.1 pounds per square foot of nitrogen, 0.2 pounds of the potash, nothing of the phosphate. And then it recommends 5.8 pounds again per 100 square foot of the sulfur, 15030. Um, you want to use the fertilizer with a percentage of nutrients closest to the above ratio. Apply according to instructions on the fertilizer bag or container, or determine the amount required from the instructions on the back side of the report. And so this is on the front side of that report. There will be a back side that it goes into it more clearly. For new plantings, if the fertilizer contains phosphate or potash, apply it in the spring or fall by mixing it with some topsoil. If the fertilizer contains only nitrogen, it should be applied in the spring by either tilling or raking it in the surface. Nitrogen is easily leached through the soil. That again is why we want you to take the soil test every three to five years. These plants require an acidic soil between 4.0 and 5.5. Remember they have specified it as azalea and rhododendron. And then to acidify the soil, use the added amount of recommended sulfur one year prior to planting, since it takes several months for this sulfur to react with the soil. So you may have wanted to plant the azaleas and rhododendrons this year, but actually preparing the bed a year in advance is going to be better. What happens if you already have azalea and rhododendron and you find that you need to add sulfur? Well, read the directions of your container of your package of sulfur, and it will tell you what to do if these are pre-existing plants. Now, we're gonna go back and take a look at this because every one of these recommendations have it's given you um, pounds per square foot. And I am a, a math phobe, math, I can do math, but I can't do it really fast in my head. I have to think about it a little bit, especially since I haven't taken algebra for about 40 years. Um, so this is your basic algebra. We're gonna go through some of these calcul or geometry actually, not even algebra. We're gonna go through some of these calculations so that you can remember how to figure out the area of your garden so you know what the best amount of, how much of this fertilizer recommendation you're gonna need to purchase and apply. So area calculations for a triangle, height times base, base times height divided by two gives you your area of a triangle. Pi r squared, um, so that's your area of a circle. And length times width is your 
area of a rectangle. So think about that. Rectangle square is like times width. Pi r squared is your area of the circle. And base times height divided by 2 is your area of a triangle. Now let's put that into practice. So here's a yard. There is no yard that is completely square, completely rectangular. There are, there are always triangles, sometimes circles in a yard. So we're going to look at the area of section A. And if we look at A, the base is 21 feet, and the, the height of that triangle is 134 feet. Base times height divided by 2. So 21 times 134, take that, divide that by 2, and it equals 1407 square three feet, 1,407 square feet. What is the area of B? Well, we're going to take it and look again at the length times the width, so 92 times 81. That's 7,452 square feet. And the area of section C, we're going to discount the area where the house is, and it's 43 times 41, so 1,763 square feet. You add all of those together, you divide them by 100, and then you need to look at what your required amount of fertilizer is for that area. And remember, that's once a year. Hey, Robin. Yes. Before you wrap up here, we have a clarification question. Alrighty. Um, is 15-0-30 ratio the fertilizer, and how does this relate to the fact that nitrogen is not needed in soil? So I think there's a little confusion about nitrogen when you were talking about how the soil test isn't looking at nitrogen and stuff like that, and then also what the ratios really mean. What was the last question? What was the second part of that? Also, what, what the ratios of the fertilizer means. Okay, so um, I'm not going to zip back to that page because I don't want to make you dizzy, but that 15, <laughs> that nitrogen is based on the organic content of your soil. So it does, they, they do when they go to the fertilizer, they don't give you a rating of your co content of your nitrogen in your soil. What they do is they look at the organic matter, and based on the content of your organic matter in the soil, they make nitrogen recommendations based on that. So that's your clarification there. You, so with phosphorus and with potassium, you actually see numbers, and with um, the alkalinity or acidity of your soil, you, you, also, you see a very specific number. With the nitrogen, you don't see an N number on the test. What you see is the organic matter in the test. And, and um, so that's why you have that NPK when they recommend that. And that's the, the, the ratio is the numbers. This is 15N to 0K to 30, um, or 50N to 0P to 30K. That's, that's the ratio between there. That's what those numbers are. Um, so, that's how they come up with that nitrogen number, even though you don't have a number specifically on the test that says M. It's the organic material they get that from. Um, and I, I also, think that, go yeah, ahead. Awesome. I just also want to point out that I think some of this, for some people in our audience, maybe got a little bit overwhelming. Um, but I just want to assure everyone out there that as your local educators, whether Robin and I are yours or there, you have a local educator in your county, we're all over the state. Uh, we love to read these soil tests and this is what we do every single day. So don't feel like you have to understand exactly what Robin and I were talking about. It's okay. That's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah. All right, Robin, I will let you I was unsharing because that was the last screen and it was up and it told you the resources. Um, that was a lot of information to go over in a short period of time. And it's all there. It's all on our Soils Lab website. They will walk you through why these portions of the test are important um, and, and the recommendations. But it's really important for you to know what your soil is like before you put plants in it because 
Katie and I and all of the other educators on this series this week want you to have a really successful gardening experience, whether you're a beginning gardener or an intermediate gardener. There's nothing worse than putting all that effort into the garden and having nothing to show for it at the end of the season. So starting from the ground up, starting with healthy soils before you even consider healthy plants is the way to go. Yeah, and that's really, you know, the, this series is called Gardening from the Ground Up. So we started with soil. And then tomorrow, we are going to build on that with our fertilizer and nutrient management. And then, you know, getting into cover crops and things like that. So this is, you know, where we're starting. If you got overwhelmed today, don't be discouraged. Uh, we're going to keep going over things and getting things figured out. There are still some uh, chats coming in here, so we're going to continue answering these questions. There was one asking, do we recommend calling your local extension office? Absolutely. Um, if you, everyone has a county extension office, so there is an extension office in your county. There are um, some, not every county has an educator like Robin or myself, but if your county does not, uh, they will work on getting you in contact and that's something that you can talk to you know other people about you know getting a county educator but just making sure that reach out to your extension office and they will get you in touch with us um julie has a really good comment about yeah. nitrogen um she finds it helpful to tell people that nitrogen is a mobile nutrient okay and yes. that means it moves through the soil that is not one that is locked into the soil it changes with the plants that you use it can be washed through the soil and it always <laughs> needs to be replenished that's yeah. that's part of it also the ratio is a percentage of the total with the balance being inert ingredients so um so Robin, there's a big question here since you just did a presentation on this. Uh, what type of soil should I be starting my seeds in? Oh, so it depends on how big your seeds are. Um, if you have teeny tiny little seeds, okay, I'm gonna back up just a little bit. You <laughs> always want to have a sterile seed, a sterile mix, so that's not from your garden, that's from a bag from your garden center or your hardware store. And you can get a variety of textures just like you have textures in your garden. And teeny tiny seeds really need that seed starting mix. That It's very fine. They're all peat based, but there's just a whole lot of peat in the seed starting mix. That way the seed doesn't get too much covered. You, you've got really good soil to seed contact moisture retention and that seed will sprout. For larger seeds like, so I start sunflowers and the larger seeds in my pots because we have so many weeds, it's just easier to identify the plant versus the weed. That can be in a coarser textured mix, but always a sterile seed starting mix so there are no insect eggs, disease, or weed seeds in it. Always make sure your containers that you're starting them in have been um, cleaned out and um, sanitized with bleach. So one part bleach for nine parts water, rinse them in that and let them dry in the sun. That way they have been disinfected and there won't be any um, spores or bacteria or anything in your pots. Yeah, and I just wanna point out, there's been a couple of questions asking about getting the soil tests that we're talking about. Um, especially with our COVID situation, soil tests are absolutely available. The soil test lab is um, busy working hard to keep up with everything. So um, you can either log on where Robin was showing you to the extension website and look for soil tests, or you again can contact your local extension educator and we can get to you. For my three counties, Cerns, Benton, and Morrison, I have been mailing those out to people. Um, so just let us know and we will make sure to get those to you to make sure that you're able to do uh, what we looked at at the beginning of the uh, presentation with the video of getting that soil test in. We make sure that these are done. Um, it's, you can do them at any year, any time of the year. We just usually see a lot in the spring. Um, Katie, I'm seeing two questions. Um, one is about fertilizing these um, seed 
seedlings mm -hmm. once you've started them in containers. And the problem with a peat-based mix or a lot of these seed starting mixes is they don't, they're really not full of nutrients. They're good for about 30 days and after that you do need to fertilize them. Um, the other question I saw was about using that peat-based fertilizer or a peat-based potting mix. And the problem is if it dries out too much, it really becomes hydrophobic. It takes a little bit of time for that peat-based mix to absorb the water. And so if you're not careful when you're watering them, the water will run down along the sides of your container and not soak through the peat. So it's always a good idea to pre-moisten any kind of potting mix you use prior to planting anything in it. So you know it's fully hydrated and then do not let it dry out all the way or it will make it difficult to rehydrate it when your plants are in it. Yes, absolutely. And light is important as well. Uh, we did. Alden and Katie, a uh, couple yep. of questions have come up kind of around okay. lakes and shoreland. So just okay. do you recommend a different mix for fertilizer if it is a shoreland property? And then also just kind of there was a request to remind folks to not add phosphorus unless very necessary. So if you could speak to those two questions. Yes, so again, starting with that soil test to know what your soil actually needs. Um, Robin, you are you work around lakes a lot more. Um, <laughs> do you want And so that's, um, so many of my lake owners have grass or they have wild areas around the lake to work as filters but you do need to be very careful about applying phosphorus-free fertilizers near lakes because you don't want that to run off into the lake. That's why it's really good to have natural plantings along your lake shore and not lawns all the way to the lake. Um, I would recommend you check out the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. They have a really good lakeshore restoration um, part of their website and they're the ones who regulate that type of thing near lakes. So they, they have been a great resource to me and checking that out and looking under, like I said, lakeshore restoration, um, they will let you know how to care for things right along the lakeshore. Katie, I see another question. Marge is asking, I heard that you no longer provide soil sample bags. And when I was watching your video, I was very envious because we haven't had those soil sample bags for years. And it's I just got them from the lab. <laughs> you, you did just get them from the lab? Like last year, I don't know. But you can use just a simple Ziploc baggie, that's fine. Yeah. Um, because we are out, we were told we couldn't get them anymore. So maybe since that period of time, they are making them again because they're awesome. They're paper bags, but they're also lined, so they're waterproof in the middle. I did want to address, there was a question a little bit ago um, that asked, soil test says I need 30, 30, 30 zero, zero. Can I use manure? So the one thing that you want to look at there is, first of all, what type of manure are you, are you using? Because different manures have different um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in them. Uh, off the top of my head, none of them would be 30-0-0. There are some that are around that 30 range, but they will also have phosphorus and potassium. If you are doing a vegetable garden, making sure that it is a composted manure, not just aged, but actually composted so that you don't have to deal with um, E. coli and salmonella and that type of stuff getting introduced into your vegetable garden. So, there are, we do have some really great recommendations that look at what the percentage of manure is and what the nutrients available based on that type of manure and how it was applied and the age of the manure and all that kind of good stuff. So there is a lot of information out there. If you were doing a 30 zero, zero, as the question asked, manure would not be uh, my go-to in that situation. And, and Katie, I see a question about seedlings dying if you're starting your own seeds in containers. And um, can you put more seeds and start over with the same containers in soil? And my, um, I would say no. And the, and the reason why is if those seedlings died due to damping off or some other um, problem like that, I would start fresh. Damping off is, um, uh, milled, it's, it's something that's within the soil. 
And so um, I'd want you to start fresh. If the seedling died because you missed watering it, that's a different that's a different story because there's not any pathogen in the soil. But if the seedling died because you didn't know, you, you're not sure why, I would start fresh just to make sure there wasn't a pathogen in the soil. We've gotten a lot of questions about earthworms and if having worms automatically means that your soil is healthy. Um, <sighs> this question's a little complicated. <laughs> It's not as straightforward as you think it would be. Um, earthworms do help to incorporate organic matter, but we have earthworms in many, many locations. And it doesn't, it's not an automatic point to, yeah, my soil is great because I have earthworms. Um, and now there, there is also the invasive jumping worm. So knowing what type of worm you have is important to know. I don't know, Robin, do you want to add? anything to that? I think, I think you've got that, Katie. It's, um, you know, earthworms, they do digest things in the soil and leave castings. And I get it because I came from the East Coast and we were always told, well, you know, your garden soil is healthy if you have earthworms. And so it is, it's a very complicated um, situation. They do aerate the soil, they loosen the soil, and they have their castings in the soil, but you still need a soil test to see if you're missing something and to see your soil texture and your pH level because the earthworms aren't going to tell you that. And all of those things working together um, worked to make a successful garden. I'm seeing some que questions in the question and answer. Katie, since you did this, Judy would like you to distinguish between composted manure versus hot manure. So straight manure, like if you went into your chicken coop and grabbed the manure out of there and spread it on your garden, is going to have th potentially things like E. coli and other bacteria, which can then get into the plants that you would be eating. Um, which obviously leads to human illness, which isn't good. A composted manure, if it is uh, composted correctly, meaning it reaches the correct temperature for the correct amount of days and is turned, um, follows the actual compost uh, specifications for composted manure, then all of those bacteria have been killed and then can be safely applied to a food crop. Aged manure is simply manure that sat outside in the sunshine and we don't know if it got hot enough. Maybe, you know, it gets kind of crusty and looks like old manure, um, but it could still have quite a few pathogens in it. So if you are applying to flowers, that's, you know, not nearly as dangerous, but if you're talking about applying to vegetable crops that you are going to be consuming, then we have to start worrying about that stuff. So that all gets into food, sta food safety and things like that. But just if you're using manure on a crop that you're planning on eating, making sure that it is properly composted manure. And any manure that you would buy like in a bag at you know, your uh, home store, that's going to be composted. But this is, if you're going to your neighbor or to your backyard chicken flock, that's a whole other story, so just wanted to talk about that. Uh, we did have questions. What is wrong with my soil? Haven't done a test yet. Can't grow carrots and radishes. One thing could be sunlight. If you don't have enough sun, um, those underground root vegetables have a really hard time growing. There could be a nutrient issue, so that would be something to look at as well. Um, if you're getting all tops and no bottoms, that could be an indication that you have a good amount of nitrogen in the soil and it's just focusing on growing the tops and not the bottoms. Yes. So Linda asks about this TV guy on channel 411 who says you can get mold, get rid of mold and eggs by watering periodically with one part hydrogen peroxide to four parts water. Is this valid? And both Katie and I are going, no, don't do that. <laughs> um, there are a lot of things out there, home remedies like this, but you've got to think home remedies, um, what damage is it going to be doing to the rest of the garden? What damage would that 
uh, the hydrogen peroxide do to um, to the livestock in your soils, to the microorganisms and things. So please do not do home remedies. I would recommend um, going with the scientists in a lab and getting a good soil test. They'll tell you what to do. There is a question on um, what's the amendment to make soil more acidic for blueberries and other acid loving plants? That was the sulfur. Okay, yep, you answered that one. Uh, sheep manure, again, it goes back to it can be useful, but you do need to make sure that you're applying it correctly and taking a look at those uh, manure recommendations to know what you are actually applying. Uh, insects and soil. Shane and Claire, are you guys going to touch on soil insects on Friday? Oh, um, we, I think we, bit, we, I think we touch on them just a little bit. Um, okay. So bring your soil insect questions back on Friday. <laughs> um, and Linda, Linda asked about the sheep manure and I just want to touch on, because um, Linda, if you have sheep, this is where I said about that ditch hay. The ditch hay um, is treat, or the grass that grows in a ditch is often treated with an herbicide that actually can live through the process of sheep and goats eating it and excreting it and that that pesticide that herbicide is still in the manure so um i know somebody who applied that manure not knowing that you know composted good because sheep and goat manure is liquid well pelleted gold how about that it's it's good but you need to make sure you know what they've been eating and that they haven't been eating the ditch hay that might have been treated by the herbicide because it, this woman applied it to her whole high tunnel, her tomato crop, and it killed every single one of the tomatoes because the herbicide was carried over. And it takes about 18 months, maybe even longer, for that herbicide to dissipate from that manure. So yes, sheep manure is great, so long as it's composted and so long as the sheep hasn't eat it, eaten the um, ditch hay with the herbicide on it. There was a question about matching veg veggies to grow with my soil analysis. So one thing that I would recommend um, would be going onto our, our extension website and looking up the vegetables you're interested in growing. We also have an A to Z list of all the vegetables and each of those gives a pH. So if you're specifically concerned, if you're in a situation like Robin where you have kind of a wacky pH situation, um, looking at that and seeing what are some things that I can grow in this area that will naturally do well with that um, type of situation. And then, you know, being sure to look at you, your nitrogen and phosphorus, potassium and all of that um, with that. Julie also noted that our, you shouldn't use lawn clippings that have been treated with a broadleaf herbicide as a mulch in a vegetable garden because most of your veggies are also broadleafs and that tends to kill things. So um, thanks, Julie, for that. So, And Bonnie is asking about the manure from alpacas. So here is where, yes, yeah, different manures and how long they have been aged or composted is going to impact the nutrients in them. You can test manure um, compost just like you can test soil from your garden. So I wouldn't, if you're concerned about it, you can send a sample of the composted manure in and they can tell you what the nutrients in that are as well. I don't know what the difference between the alpacas and the different ruminants are. You're right, Bonnie, it can change, not only from different types of animals, but also what those animals are fed. So if you're concerned, have it tested. So Stephanie is from, originally from Texas, moved to Minnesota. We have a different uh, growing season, absolutely. <laughs> a little shorter up here. And recommend for moving seedlings outdoor, and then what is the ideal time to conduct a soil sample? Uh, with the soil sample, you can really do that at any time. A lot of people do it in the spring before they uh, plant, but you could absolutely do it in the fall as well. It really just depends on your situation. I get most of mine in the spring, but some people are like, oh shoot, I forgot to do it this spring, had another bad growing season, I want to do it this fall. So, you know, as long as the ground isn't frozen, you can do a soil test, but spring is most typical. 
Uh, Robin, do you want to touch on moving veggies or plants outdoors? Yes, yeah, so um, most of the plants that you're going to start are um, tender annuals. Many of them are that you're going to start, especially for your vegetable gardens. And so the recommendation I have for you, Stephanie, because I moved from New Orleans, Louisiana, 25 years ago to Minnesota, so I know about the differences in gardening there. Um, 50 degrees overnight. It, once the nighttime temperatures are consistently around 50 degrees at night, you're good to go moving them outside. Now, if you're going to move them outside and bring them in overnight, that's different. Remember that when you move your plants outside, don't set them in the full sun right away. You want to ease them into that because even the inside environment is so controlled, the outside environment will shock them. The sun will be brighter than anything you had them under. The wind is going to be an impact. The changing temperatures abruptly is going to impact them. So you want to give them the easiest transition you can. So take them out, put them in shade at first, move them gradually into the sun. And if it looks like it's going to be under 50 degrees at night, bring them inside. And my plants have done that, moved in and out and in and out. Um, that's what husbands and children are for. They carry for me. <laughs> uh, can you recommend a soil mix for starting slow growing perennial and wildflower seeds? Mainly efforts tend to get too wet and they get brown and die. So would definitely look at what type of soil are you starting it in like a potting soil or a peat mix or are you trying to start it in straight up garden soil um, and then what type of soil mixture do you have there would be the first steps. Uh, Robin, anything to add to that? And that's, you just want to be careful about how you, um, how you water. You don't want them to be too wet and you don't want them to cool off too much in there. That can encourage the damping off. Now, Brenda has asked a couple times about testing yep. for E. coli. I was school. getting to that. <laughs> oh, good, good. I'm going to let you get to that, Katie. Um, I don't know of a particular one in the soil, and if someone else does, absolutely. There are water tests that you can do that can test your water specifically for E. coli. Um, I, does anyone have anything to add to that? I don't know of a specific soil test that we have any ways um, that specifically looks for E. coli in your soil. Okay. So absolutely, there aren't um, currently any more questions right here, right now, but please continue to reach out to any of our team here today. You've all received emails from me specifically because you're on our call here today. Uh, and feel free to continue to do that. If I'm not in your county, I will share it with your county educator or go to the, your county extension uh, website and they can help you with that. You will be receiving survey information. Please take the time to fill that out. We want to hear from you to make sure that we are doing the best we can and providing great uh, educational opportunities for you. And uh, you will receive tomorrow's link uh, here later this afternoon along with that survey link. So feel free. We hope that you'll join us again tomorrow for Adam Troy and Bob talking about fertilizer and nutrient deficiencies. We're really excited about that one and the rest of the week as well. Uh, thank you all for joining us here today and I think that's all we have. You are welcome everyone. We appreciate the thank yous. Thank you. Yeah, great job everyone. Uh, oh, we did get a message from Joe saying E. coli is ubiquitous in the environment. Fill soil samples, it is used as an indicator organism in water samples where you don't normally find it. In soil, you would likely get a positive test almost every time. Thank you to our friendly local soil scientist, Joe. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. You're awesome. <laughs> I don't know if you guys want to hang on for a little bit or. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Strategize. <laughs> Thanks for being rock star behind the scenes guys today.
Takes a village. <laughs> As a soil and insect enthusiast, I really enjoyed the presentation. <laughs> I'm very glad. I felt very overwhelmed in the first five minutes, but it got you. You did. Oh, you did a great job. You did a great oh, job, fine. Katie. There's, there are always those tech. The, well, it was one of those where I was like, "Well, when I speak into my speaker, you can hear me." And when yes, I'm, um, do we want to stop recording? Yeah, I was just gonna do 